Okay, so let's talk about some background. Who knows Moore's Law? Yep. Sixty-five. Yeah. Double the amount of resources. So Moore's predicted who is the Moore, uh, Gordon Moore uh, was actually the founder of Intel. He predicted in 1965 that the number of or the amount of resources in a chip would be doubled every 18 to 24 uh, months, which is like uh, a one and a half year to two years. So if I were to give you a layman example, like we have a class size and let's assume that we have 20 computers in, um, in this classroom. And if I were to predict that uh, the number of computers in this classroom or number of resources, computing resources, will be doubled every two years, how would it be possible? What we can do, while keeping the size of the classroom same, how can the number of resources be doubled? This was his prediction, which turns out to be a law later on, and it hold, um, it held true for like half a century, almost. So we have like 20 computers. Um, what we can do is to shrink the size of a computer. Like if you are using a computer with a monitor and CPU, we can shrink the size by using laptops or even further by number of um, replacing laptops with iPads or uh, like uh, tablets, okay? So once the size of the resource is shrinking, we can accommodate much, uh, many number of like uh, more than uh, the original number of resources. So this was his prediction the number of resources on an integrated circuit. Integrated circuit means like circuit which has integrated components on a chip, okay? It will be doubled every two years. And this law actually held true until, um, until 2020 almost, and now it is becoming saturated, which means that the size of the resource, the smallest component, which is a switch or a transistor, cannot be shrink further, okay? Again, uh, I'll give you an example of why it cannot be shrink further. But this was the Moore's Law. And um, yeah, it held true for like half a century. If you talk about the classes of computers, which has supercomputers, dedicated special servers, high-end scientific and engineering calculations, it has the highest capability, but these are not general purpose computers. Uh, other than supercomputers, we have embedded computers, um, which has a stringent performance, power, and cost constraints. If you talk about the post-PC era, again, uh, we are just discussing the background and introduction of this course. Most likely, we will start discussing technical things by the end of this lecture, or probably um, uh, in the next one. You need water or something? Okay, so here you can see the number of manufactured um, uh, devices per year of tablets and smartphones which reflect the post-PC era versus the personal computers and traditional cell phones. You can see smartphones represent the recent growth in the cell phone industry and it passed the post-PC in 2000, um, sorry, in PC to 2011. You can also see the PC tablets and traditional cell phones categories are uh, all declining. The peak volume years are 2011 for cell phones, you can see here, and then it started declining. And for, for the computers, PCs, it's 2014. And for um, the tablets, it's, um, it's uh, 2014, yes. For, for the PCs, it's 2012. So you can see the number of um, smartphones manufactured nowadays is clearly increasing. So we have in post-PC era, we have the personal mobile devices, which includes smartphones, tablets, electronic glasses. Now the cloud computing uh, has become a tradition. Um, we have the Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Services, and so on. Okay, so these are just uh, basic things that we are supposed to be covering as a background. If you talk about what does the program consist of? 
a typical application just like a word processor, Microsoft word processor, uh, may consist of millions of lines of codes uh, built upon a sophisticated uh, software libraries that implement complex functions in support of the application. So we have like an application software which is written in high level language which you have been using like Python or C, C++. Then we have a system software. So there are many types of system software but two types are very common which is one is the operating system and the another one is compiler. So the basic job of compiler is to translate high level language code to a machine code uh, using the assembler in between. The operating system is actually used for multiple things like handling input and output, the external inputs and producing an output, managing memory and allocating sources, scheduling tasks. For example, if you are running multiple applications on your computer, how and uh, which, which application has to be prioritized and we need to share the resources so operating system takes care of this. And deep down is the main hardware, which is actually the focus of this uh, course, which can consist of processor, memory, and some other controllers, which we may not be discussing. So this is what um, is you write a code, compile it into assembly language, and assembler turns it into machine language. Okay, any questions so far? Again, this is just an information background and introductory information. If you talk about the components of a computer, the traditional computer, we usually have uh, all the computers have some basic components like an input, output, the processor, the control unit, uh, whatever the input is provided, the control unit informs the processor what it is supposed to be doing on the data path and then the processor produce the output which is stored in the memory and then produce it for the user. But if you talk about the post PC devices like uh, touch screen, uh, tablets, we have some additional advanced uh, components like a resistive and capacitive touch type. So capacitive touch type allows multiple touch simultaneously. There are different uh, types of touch exist. If we go further deep into this kind of boxes, let's say the iPhone XS Max, it has like LCD screen, battery, computer board, some other additional modules like a Wi-Fi or internet module. If you look into the computer board, it consists of a processor. Here A12 is the model of their processor. Along with this processor, there are some other components like um, Texas Instruments battery charger which handles the how the battery is charged and some other components like an external memory and so on and so forth. If you go further deep into the processor, it has the data path, the control unit, the actual arithmetic logic unit, and the uh, data path performs the arithmetic operations and control path tells the data path what operation, where to uh, fetch the instruction from where to store it in the memory or produce the signal to the output. And we have cache memory also. So cache memory is a small portion of a memory which is built inside the processor. So sometimes we have an external memory. You, you might have already seen the micro SD cards. These are the external memories which you can insert to a system or replace it to anything else. But we also have a memory in, built inside the chip. That is usually smaller in size, and the technology that is used to build those uh, makes it more faster. Okay, that is called the SRAM technology, Static Random Access Memory Technology. We will be talking about memory later at the end of this course. Uh, but yeah, so these are just some basic uh, information that you should be aware of before starting what we are going to do in this course. All right, so the manufacturing of a chip begins with the semiconductor, which is usually silicon. Okay, silicon is the name of the semiconductor that we use. Why do we use semiconductor? And what does it say? Semiconductor means like it's not a perfectly uh, conducting material. It is discovered or it has been used that we can add some additional processes, additional impurities to make it either <laughs> act as a perfect conductor or make it as a perfect insulator 
which does not conduct electricity, or as a switch. So the same material can be used as a conductor, insulator, as a switch. That's why the entire circuit, entire processor, can be built on the same um, silicon material. Okay, so it is usually start off with this. So this is the silicon. Uh, what you see in this picture is a rod composed of a silicon crystal. The diameter is about like eight to twelve inches, which is cut into these deep pieces, which are like twelve to twenty-four inches uh, long. This this is simply called the silicon ingot. So this is the overview of how the chip is manufactured. This is silicon ingot, which is passed through the slicer. It converts into uh, wafers. Of uh, the thickness of each wafer is about like certain uh, millimeters, 0 0.1 inch thick, thick. And after 20 to 40 processing steps, these are the chemical processes that deposit the pattern, the circuit pattern, on these wafers. So these round um, chips is called generally referred as wafers. So the circuits are patterned. So this is one chip. This is another chip. This is another chip. All are the same chips. Okay. After this, it is passed through the testing phase, and they have some test which identify whether which pattern is working fine. If certain patterns are not working fine, after dicing it into the dies, they are um, excluded to proceed from the further steps. So these one, when this wafer is cut into these shapes, these small components, these small components are generally referred as dies. Okay. So this is another term for the chip or integrated circuit. Once these dies are ready, they are put into the package, which you see normally see it black in color. You remember this one? So this is actually the package where the in, where the that die is placed inside it. Okay. So once it is packed into that black packaging, it is again passed through a testing phase, which is called the part tester. Again the part which is not working is excluded. They are just simply wasted. There is no way you can fix it. So if some chip is not working, you cannot open the packaging and go and fix that. It is just thrown away. Okay. So and then once it is verified, it is shipped to the customers. So these are the two examples of the Intel Core i7 and Intel Core 10th generation processor. So this is a 300 millimeter wafer. And this is also a 300 millimeter wafer, which means the diameter is 300 millimeter. There are 280 chips. Here, there are 506 chips. Okay, and of course, uh, this 10th generation chip is much more powerful than this one because it contains much more advanced functions in, uh, implemented in it. The technology that is being used is 30, 32 nanometer technology and 10 nanometer. What does that mean? Uh, 32 nanometer or 10 nanometer. Yep. The size of the smallest feature they can put on that wafer. Yeah. So the smallest feature, which is which we commonly refer to as switch, the transistor. So it's the size of the transistor. So the transistor size here in this case is 32 nanometer technology, and here it's 10 nanometer. The size is further reduced. Uh, the size of a transistor is further reduced to 10 nanometer. Okay, and what size actually? So the size is like if you are talking about the switch, where the where the uh, electron flow from one end, for example, one end to another end. So this is generally referred as gate, and what what the technology we talk about is 32 nanometer. So this is, defines this length, 32 nanometer, and it's further reduced down to 10 nanometer. So what happens when? the technology reduces down this path. What happens? So electron is flowing from one end to another end. And here, the electron flows uh, has to travel for a shorter path only. OK, so which means that electron will flow faster. The current will flow faster. And the, um, your computer will execute applications faster. OK? Any question? Good. So this is just the basic or uh, very quick overview uh, on, and an introduction in the background.